These excerpts come from Walter Pater's Plato and Platonism, and I'd like to introduce this current selection with a few quotes which precede it just to give some context. Philosophy itself, mental and moral, has its preparation, its forethoughts, in the poetry that preceded it, a powerful generalization thrown into some salient phrase, such as that of Heraclitus, Pantare, all things fleet away, may startle a particular age by its novelty. It takes possession only because all along its route was somewhere among the natural, though but half-developed instincts of the human mind itself. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that in Plato, in spite of his wonderful savour of literary freshness, there is nothing absolutely new, or rather, as in many other very original products of human genius, the seemingly new is old also, a palimpsest, a tapestry of which the actual threads have served before, or like the animal frame itself, every particle of which has already lived and died many times over. And now the quote proper. Heraclitus, a writer of philosophy and prose, yet of a philosophy which was half poetic figure, half generalized fact, in style crabbed and obscure, but stimulant, invasive, not to be forgotten. He too might be thought, as a writer of prose, one of the fathers of Plato. His influence, however, on Plato, though himself a Heraclitian in early life, was by way of antagonism or reaction. Plato's stand against any philosophy of motion becoming, as we say, something of a fixed idea with him. Heraclitus of Ephesus. What Ephesus must have been just then is denoted by the fact that it was one of the 12 cities of the Ionian League, died about 40 years before Plato was born. Here then at Ephesus, the much frequented center of the religious life of Ionia, itself so lately emancipated from its tyrants, Heraclitus of ancient hereditary rank, an aristocrat by birth and temper, amid all the bustle of still undiscredited Greek democracy, had reflected, not to his peace of mind, on the mutable character of political as well as of physical existence. Perhaps, early as it was, on the mutability of intellectual systems also, that modes of thought and practice had already been in and out of fashion. Empire certainly had lived and died around, and in Ephesus, as elsewhere, the privileged class had gone to the wall. In this era of unrestrained youthfulness, of Greek youthfulness, one of the haughtiest of that class, as being also of nature's aristocracy, and a man of powerful intellectual gifts, Heraclitus asserts the native liberty of thought at all events, becomes, we might truly say, sickly with the pale cast of his philosophical questioning. Amid the irreflective actors in that rapidly moving show, so entirely immersed in its superficial as it is, that they have no feeling of themselves, he becomes self-conscious, he reflects, and his reflection has the characteristic melancholy of youth when it is forced suddenly to bethink itself, and for a moment feels already old, feels the temperature of the world about it sensibly colder. Its very ingeniousness, its sincerity, will make the utterance of what comes to mind just then somewhat shrill or, or over-emphatic. Yet Heraclitus, thus superbly turning aside from the vulgar to think, so early in the impetuous springtide of Greek history, does but reflect, after all, the aspect of what actually surrounds him when he cries out, and his philosophy was no matter of formal treatise or system, but of harsh, protesting cries. All things give way, nothing remaineth. There had been inquirers before him of another sort, purely physical inquirers, whose bold, contradictory, seemingly impious guesses how and of what primary elements the world of visible things, the sun, the stars, the brutes, their own souls and bodies, had been composed, were themselves a part of the bold enterprise of that romantic age, a series of intellectual adventurers, of a peace with its adventures in unknown lands or upon the sea. The resultant intellectual chaos expressed the very spirit of gifted and sanguine but insubordinate youth. Remember that the word youth came to mean rashness, insolence, questioning, deciding, rejecting, on mere rags and tatters of evidence, unbent to discipline, unmethodical, irresponsible. Those opinions too, coming and going, those conjectures as to what underlay the sensible world were themselves but fluid elements on the changing surface of existence. Surface, we say, but was there really anything beneath it? That was what, to the majority of his hearers, his readers, Heraclitus, with an eye perhaps on practice, seemed to deny. Perpetual motion, alike in things and in men's thoughts about them, the sad, self-conscious philosophy of Heraclitus, like one, knowing beyond his years, in this barely adolescent world which he is so eager to instruct, makes no pretense to be able to restrain that. Was not the very essence of thought itself also such perpetual motion? A baffling transition from the dead past, alive one moment since, to a present, itself deceased in turn, ere we can say, is it here? 
a keen analyst of the facts of nature and mind, a master presumably of all the knowledge that then there was, a vigorous definer of thoughts. He does but refer the superficial movement of all persons and things around him to deeper and still more masterful currents of universal change, stealthily withdrawing the apparently solid earth itself from beneath one's feet. The principle of disintegration, the incoherency of fire or flood for Heraclitus, these are but very lively instances of, of movements, subtler, yet more wasteful, still, are inherent in the primary elements alike of matter and of the soul. And this quote here is from the Cratylus. Heraclitus says somewhere that everything gives way and nothing stands fast. But the principle of lapse, of waste, was in fact in oneself. No one has ever passed twice over the same stream. Nay, the passenger himself is without identity. Upon the same stream at the same moment we do and do not embark, for we are and are not. And likening the things that are flowing to the river, he says, you cannot step into the same river twice. And this rapid change, if it did not make all knowledge impossible, made it wholly relative, of a kind that is to say, valueless in the judgment of Plato. Man, the individual, at this particular vanishing point of time and place, becomes the measure of all things. Yet from certain fragments in which the Logos is already named, we may understand that there had been another side of the doctrine of Heraclitus. An attempt on his part, after all, to reduce that world of chaotic mutation to cosmos, to the unity of a reasonable order, by the search for and the notation, if there be such, of an antiphonal rhythm or logic, which, proceeding uniformly from movement to movement, as in some intricate musical theme, might link together in one those contending, infinitely diverse impulses. It was an act of recognition, even on the part of a philosophy of the inconsecutive, the incoherent, the insane, of that wisdom which reacheth from one end to end, sweetly and strongly ordering all things. But if the weeping philosopher, the first of the pessimists, find the finds the grounds of his melancholy in the sense of universal change, still more must he weep at the dullness of men's ears to that continuous strain of melody throughout it. In truth, what was sympathetic with the hour and the scene in the Heraclitian doctrine was the boldly aggressive, the paradoxical and negative tendency there, in natural collusion, as it was, with the destructiveness of undisciplined youth, that sense of rapid dissolution which, according to one's temperament and one's luck in things, might extinguish or kindle all the more eagerly an interest in the mere phenomena of existence, of one so hasty passage through the world. The theory of the perpetual flux was indeed an apprehension of which the full scope was only to be realized by a later age, in alliance with a larger knowledge of the natural world. A closer observation of the phenomena of mind than was possible, even for Heraclitus at that early day. So the seeds of almost all scientific ideas might seem to have been dimly enfolded in the mind of antiquity, but fecundated, admitted to their full working pr prerogative only by one, or one by one, in after ages, by good favour of the special intellectual conditions belonging to a particular generation, which, on a sudden, finds itself preoccupied by a formula, not so much new as renovated by new application. It is in this way that the most modern metaphysical and the most modern empirical philosophies alike have illustrated emphatically, justified, expanded, the divination, so we may make bold to call it under the new light now thrown upon it, of the ancient theorist of Ephesus. The entire modern theory of development, in all its various phases, proved or unprovable, what is it but old Heraclitianism awake once more in a new world, and grown to full proportions? It is the burden of Hegel on the one hand, to whom nature and art and polity and philosophy, aye, and religion too, each in its long historic series, are but so many conscious movements in the secular process of the eternal mind, and on the other hand of Darwin and Darwinism, for which type itself properly is not, but is only always becoming. The bold paradox of Heraclitus is, in effect, repeated on all sides, as the vital persuasion just now of a cautiously reasoned experience, and, in illustration of the very law of change which it asserts, may itself presently be superseded as, com as a commonplace. Think of all that subtly disguised movement, Latin processus, Bacon calls it, again, as if by a kind of anticipation, which modern research has detected, measured, hopes to reduce to minuter or ally to still larger currents, in what had seemed most substantial to the naked eye, the inattentive mind, to the observation and experiment of the physical inquirer of today, the eye and the sun it lives by reveal themselves, after all, as Heraclitus had declared, 
scarcely serious he seemed to those around him, as literally in constant extinction and renewal, the sun only going out more gradually than the human eye, the system meanwhile, of which it is the centre, in ceaseless movement no whither. Our terrestrial planet is in constant increase by meteoric dust, moving on it through endless time out of infinite space. The arts drift down the river onto the plains, as still loftier mountains found their level there ages ago. The granite kernel of the earth, it is said, is ever-changing in its very substance, its molecular constitution, by the passage through it of electrical currents. And the Darwinian theory, that species, the identifying form of animal and vegetable life, immutable though they seem now, as of old in the Garden of Eden, are fashioned by slow development, while perhaps millions of years go by. Well, every month is adding to its evidence. Nay, the idea of development, that too, a thing of growth, developed in the progress of reflection, is at last evading one by one, as the secrets of their explanation, all the produ products of mind, the very mind itself, the abstract reason, our certainty, for instance, that two and two make four. Gradually, we have come to think, or to feel, that primary certitude. Political constitutions, again, as it, we now see so clearly, are not made, cannot be made, but grow. Races, laws, arts, have their origin and end, are themselves ripples only on the great river of organic life, and language is changing on our very lips. In Plato's day, the Heraclitian flux, so deep down in nature itself, the flood, the fire, seemed to have laid hold on man, on the social and moral world, dissolving or disintegrating opinion. First principles, faith, establishing a morphism, so to call it. There also. All along indeed the genius, the good gifts of Greece to the world, had had much to do with the mobility of its temperament. Only, when Plato came into potent contact with his countrymen, Pericles, Phidias, Socrates being now gone, in politics, in literature and art, in men's characters, the defect naturally incident to that fine quality had come to have unchecked sway. From the lifeless background of an unprogressive world, Egypt, Syria, frozen Scythia, a world in which the unconscious social aggregate had been everything, the conscious individual, his capacity and rights, almost nothing, the Greek had stepped forth, like the young prince in the fable, to set things going. To the philosophic eye, however, about the time when the history of Thucydides leaves off, they might seem to need a regulator, ere the very wheels wore themselves out. Mobility. We do not think that a necessarily undesirable condition of life, of mind, of the physical world about us, tis the dead things, we may remind ourselves, that after all are most entirely at rest, and might reasonably hold that motion, vicious, fallacious, infectious motion, as Plato inclines to think, covers all that is best worth being. And as for philosophy, mobility, versatility, the habit of thought that can most adequately follow the sub subtle movement of things, that, surely, were the secret of wisdom, of the true knowledge of them. It means susceptibility, sympathetic intelligence, capacity, in short. It was the spirit of God that moved, moves still, in every form of real power, everywhere. Yet to Plato, motion became becomes a token of unreality in things, of falsity in our thoughts about them. It is just this principle of mobility, in itself so welcome to all of us, that, with all his contriving care for the future, he desires to withstand. Everywhere he displays himself as an advocate of the immutable. The Republic is a proposal to establish it indefectibly in a very precisely regulated, a very exclusive community, which shall be a refuge for elect souls from an ill-made world. And to conclude this section, I'd like to add this follow-up from Walter Pater as well. Metaphysical formulae have always their practical equivalents. The ethical alliance of Heraclitus is with the Sophists the, and the Cyrenaics or the Epicureans, that of Hermenides with Socrates and the Cynics or the Stoics. The cynical Stoic ideal of a static calm is as truly the moral or practical equivalent of the Parmenidean doctrine of the one, as the Cyrenaic pleasure of the ideal now is the practical equivalent of the doctrine of motion, and, as sometimes happens, what seems hopelessly perverse as a metaphysic for the understanding is found to be realizable enough as one of the many phases of our so flexible human feeling.